I love that. Stop throwing stuff away. Don't throw your trash out. You know, take care of things around you. You had your hand up. Clean up the beach. I like it. You know, there are a lot of great ways cleaning, making sure you don't throw down trash, picking up trash when you see it. And then there are some real easy ways and simple ways that we can make sure that our world stays beautiful. I brought here a container that used to have Miss Judy's tuna in it from Billy Seafood. And if you haven't tried that, I am not a paid endorser, but honey, I'm telling you, this is the best tuna salad on the beach. And then you get this cool container that you can reuse. And I was thinking about how when we go to the beach and we want to take snacks, sometimes we take these like individual bags of snacks, and then we have this wrapper that we have to take care of, and it goes in the trash, and it goes in the landfill. But if you take your Miss Judy's tuna container, and you fill it with snacks from a big bag, you know, pretzels or goldfish or whatever you want, and then you can bring this home, and you can wash it, and reuse, reuse, reuse. So that's one of the ways that we can all take care of our earth. And the same thing applies to water. If you take your handy Delta Airlines water bottle, I'm not a paid endorser, but Delta Airlines is the best airline, just saying. But you know, you drink this water and then what happens to the bottle? You have to throw it away. Hopefully you put it in the recycling. But most of things that are plastic don't get recycled. So instead of this little bottle to the beach, you take this little guy, fill it up with water, drink it, bring it home, wash it, and reuse it again. And I am even showing you all these things in my Joe Lamb Realty. I'm not a paid endorser. <laughs> but this is a bag that I've had for years and years and years and years, and I can reuse it. So those are just little things that everybody can do. And that will help us keep our beautiful world beautiful. So this week, talk with your parents about ways that you guys can help keep things around us very pretty. And maybe a good idea is to go on a trash walk on the beach, take a bag with you, put the trash in it, throw the trash away, and we can make our environment nice. Let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for our beautiful Outer Banks. And all together, all of God's children said... Amen. You guys may go off to Children's Church, and there goes Miss Brandy. You can follow her out there. As we go into our time of prayer this morning, um, let us be mindful of those things. You know, in Genesis, God calls us to take care of our creation. It tells us directly there that we are stewards of everything that God has given us. And so I hope somewhere today you may be thinking about ways that you can maybe take the next step in doing that, in, in reducing, reusing, and recycling. That's all part of our Christian mission here in this beautiful place that we get to live. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for the beauty of your creation, and we thank you for the privilege, the privilege that it is to live here in the Outer Banks. And so, God, we do pray that you would encourage us and inspire us in ways of making this place sustainable and more beautiful for generations to come. We are not unaware of what you have given us in this beautiful earth. And yet sometimes our actions betray that. Sometimes our actions seem very self-centered. So we just ask for that awareness that you would be present with us in ways where we can be making our community beautiful again. Thank you, Father, for this incredible gift of creation. Father, this morning as we look across the world, we see so many places in strife. Once again, we pray for victims of a mass shooting. Once again, we pray for Ukraine. Once again, we pray for those who are victims of domestic violence. Once again, we pray that your son, the Prince of Peace, would come and rule. Father, sometimes we get overwhelmed with things that are happening in our world. Sometimes we get overwhelmed with things that are happening in our home. And so we pray, God, that you would remind us in those moments that you reign, that we are citizens of heaven, that we have something beyond this moment this tragedy, this situation, this illness, this death. Because you sent your son to give us life. And you sent him with a mission to give us life that is abundant. 
So help us to find that abundance in you. Help us to rely on one another in prayer and in care and in communication and in service so that we know we're not alone when we're going through something. Help us to remember that here at this church, we have pastors who care. We have people who care. We have people who will bring a casserole. We have Stephen ministers who will lend an ear. We have so many ways that we can be the church together. Father, we thank you for this privilege of being part of this community. For those in our community this morning who can't be with us because they are ill or in hospital beds, in hospice care, unable to get up from their beds, we pray that the presence that we feel in this moment would be something that they feel as well so that they know that they're not alone, that their church loves them, and that their God is a God of healing, a God of strength, a God of support, and a God of might. Thank you, Father, for your presence with us. Father, we pray all these things today in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Let us continue worshiping God with the giving of his tithe and our offering. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Father, we thank you for all of your provision, for all of your blessings, for all of your mercy. We thank you that you are interested in us. Father, we pray that you would bless these offerings, that they can go into the world to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere. Amen. Amen. Our scripture for this morning, Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Please be seated. So for the month of July, we are discussing beauty and how beauty interacts and informs with the Christian life. And this morning, we are talking more specifically about the beauty of creation and how God's creation can draw us into God's presence. And having been drawn into God's presence, it can then inspire us to worship. I mentioned last week that if it weren't for humanity's draw towards natural beauty, I mean, the Outer Banks wouldn't exist, or at least they wouldn't exist as it exists today. I mean, because as human beings, we are drawn towards natural beauty. We are drawn towards the vastness of the ocean, the playfulness and the power of a wave, the colors and creatures of a shoreline, right? the burst of light and warmth from a sunrise or a sunset, right? memories created at the beach, right? the natural beauty of, of God's creation. It's why folks live here. It's why folks visit here. Right? They come or we come chasing moments of beauty. And the summer is a time where we are ever aware of that beauty as guests come. Um, we're aware of that beauty as some plan vacations based around seeking out or chasing after natural beauty. I was doing some reading this past week, and this past year, national park visits have smashed every previous record. I mean, it's just the, so much so that it's almost become a problem, the crowds in these, nat- in these national parks. I mean, one, as folks crave the outdoors during COVID season, but also just this draw towards the natural beauty, the the created beauty of the world, right? The draw towards mountains and rivers and oceans and and deserts. There's like something in us. It's like something in the way that we were made causes us to, to pause and stare at a sunset or want to wake up early for a sunrise. I've rarely met someone who, as the sun is setting, they say, oh, that's terrible, Right? It's like all of us, we're, we're just drawn to it. It's something in us finds it beautiful. And we try and capture it, at least I do. I try and capture it on my, my little iPhone camera. I can't tell you how many photos of, of water or sunsets that I have on my little camera. But it's like in the moment, like it just looks so beautiful. You want it to last longer. You want what you're feeling, what you're experiencing to last a little bit longer. And as I scroll through my iPhone photos, it, it just doesn't do much for me now. But in the moment, right, it's beautiful. And we just long for that, that feeling to last. So this morning, I want you to reflect on, on how you connect with God through creation. We've got so many wonderful opportunities here to, to connect with God through creation, fishing, surfing, Sailing, shell hunts, hikes, sunsets, gardening, birding. There's all sorts of opportunities to, to connect with God through creation. I mean, I wonder, have you had a moment right, while you're enjoying or experiencing the beauty of the created world, you just felt drawn closer to Christ, drawn closer to the one who created it all? Our scripture this morning is a psalm. And so many of the psalms, and a good portion of scripture for that matter, 
interact with God's creation. Interact with, with the created world. We've got creation stories, stories of animals, stories of, of gardening. In the Old Testament, there's so many stories about the land that, that, that deal with uh, the, the land. In the New Testament even, we've got stories on the Sea of Galilee, meetings with God on, on mountaintops. It seems when, when you read Jesus' teaching, it seems as though Jesus was walking around kind of paying attention and observing the, the natural world around him and weaving it into object lessons and sermons as he talks about wheat and harvest and the flowers of, of the field and a sower and seed. So much of God's story, of Jesus' stories, interact with the created world all around him. However, what I'm drawn to about the Psalms is that it seems as though the psalmist is just admiring right, the beauty of the created world. And in response, he can't help but worship. Can't help but write a poem. Can't help but write a song of praise. And, and a number of these psalms are from David. And we know David had some hard stuff going on in his life. Sometimes David was on the run. Sometimes people were trying to, to kill him and threatening his life. Yet still, he could sit back see the world that God created, and couldn't help but write a song or a poem of praise. Couldn't help when looking at, at the world that God created. Couldn't help but worship. And this particular psalm, Psalm 19, starts off talking about God's glory revealed through creation, through the skies, through the stars. And I want to read for you the scripture again, verses 1 through 6, but this time through the message paraphrase. Or Eugene Peterson puts it this way. God's glory is on tour in the skies. God craft on exhibit across the horizon. Madam Day holds classes every morning. Professor Knight lectures every evening. Their words aren't heard. Their voices aren't recorded. But their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. God makes a huge dome for the sun, a super dome. And the morning sun's a new husband leaping from his honeymoon bed. The day-breaking sun, an athlete racing to the tape. That's how God's word vaults across the skies. From sunrise to sunset. Melting ice, scorching deserts, warming hearts to faith. I love the way that Peterson puts a couple of those verses. Right? Their words aren't heard. Their voice is not recorded. But their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. That idea that, that every day there is a sermon. Right? There is a message that creation is giving that points us back to God, to the one who created it all, and it fills the entire earth. I mean, I wonder, have you heard that sermon before? I mean, looking up to, to the heavens or to the sky, have, have you heard that message? The sermon of the sun, moon, stars, and sky that declares the glory of the Lord. I mean, this morning, again, can you recall a moment where the natural beauty of the earth right, brought you closer to Christ? Or where you had what you might describe as a spiritual experience? Right, again, I've got friends who, who don't proclaim you know, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit the way that we do but would say they have spiritual experiences when, when in nature, that it does something in them, that it stirs something inside of them. I would call that the Holy Spirit stirring something inside them as they're drawn to the beauty of the created world. I mean, the beauty of creation points us towards the one who created it all. And as Christians, we should respond the same way that the psalmist does when we encounter this beauty, right? to worship, to worship the one who created it all. I like the popular song, if the stars were made to worship, so will I. But this morning, I'm also aware that there are some hindrances and stumbling blocks when it comes to our relationship with the beauty of the earth. I mean, Betsy named some of them. We don't have time to, to get into it today. Maybe it's a standalone sermon series, but, but as Christians, we should be on the forefront of caring about God's creation. If we believe that God created the heavens and the earth, that the beauty of the earth point us back towards God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then shouldn't we be caretakers of that gift, stewards of that beauty? 
I mean, so one hindrance to experiencing the beauty of the earth are all the ways and places that that beauty has been marred or, or hidden due to harmful action or exploitive pra- practice. And where we see that beauty harmed, we should have a role in conserving, caring for, and partnering with God in the redeeming of the beauty of creation. I mean, at our church, we have a, a creation care team. Steve McDonald, Jim Davis, Elaine McCown, and others are, are leaders in this team attempting to, to play a small part in working to see that that future generations have access to to the beauty of the earth. That's one hindrance we have to experiencing the beauty of the earth. I think another one is a bit more practical. It's just our inability to to pay attention to God's beauty. Our inability to to pay attention to to where God is revealing himself around us through the created world. To give ourselves the, the time and space to pay attention and to consider the beauty that might be all around us. And it happens for a bunch of reasons. Sometimes it's a slam-packed schedule where we find ourselves bouncing from here to there with, without any time to, to consider the beauty that's right before our very eyes. I mean, I've got times, I, I live here, and I have times, maybe you can identify, hopefully not, where someone will ask me, hey, have you been in the water recently? I'll say, not only have I not surfed, I haven't even seen the ocean in weeks. <laughs> And it's like right there. You can barely drive down the road without seeing it. But there's, there's seasons of life where it feels as though you just never even, you, you can't even see it. <laughs> hadn't, it not, hadn't, sir, hadn't seen the water. And I know that if I were to take just five minutes, pull off, sit down for five minutes, it would do something in me. Right? It changed, it calmed something in me. Right? It would lead me back into gratitude. So I try just to make a little space for the natural beauty that's right in front of you. And not only is it a schedule, it's also the the draw towards technology or the draw towards screen and and the dopamine hits that that you can get from an iPhone. It's hard enough to to pay attention as is, but now with these machines that are constantly calling for us, demanding our attention, it makes it even harder to experience some of the natural beauty right in front of us. With a a world of information at your fingertips, sometimes it can be hard to pay attention to the leaf, a blade of grass, a butterfly. To to notice. Sometimes it it, it can feel impossible. And maybe some of it is is getting back to that sense of, of childlike wonder. You know, one of the things I like about real little kids is that they're just amazed or almost shocked at times by, like, everything. Right? The, the, the feel of, of grass on their feet right, can induce a smile. Right? The way that, that sand feels or sand tastes at times. Right? Can't help but try it. Right? The surprise when, 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 a, when a little guy puts his hand in water. Right, that surprise and joy that comes from that, that childlike sense of wonder, right? Being taken with, with, with a leaf and the crunchy sound it makes. I think some of it is, is a, there's something too when Jesus says you've got to become like a child. To recapturing that, that childlike sense of wonder. I had a thought of that this past week as, you know, we took our family to do fireworks off Herbert Perry Road at the end there. And it was a, a perfect spot for viewing and launching off. We had a friend that was launching off huge fireworks. So we got to launch off some, some huge fireworks, but you could also see Manios and Nags Head. And you could see all across the beach just fireworks shooting off everywhere. It was a perfect spot to, to view uh, the fireworks on 4th of July. And as things were, were wrapping up, it was pitch black. You know, I was still watching some of the fireworks. We had already launched off all ours. And it looked as though... One of the towns was getting near their finale. And so I was calling for the boys. I was like, Hurt, come on, come on. You're the reason we're here. Like, like, let's look at these things. Like, it is getting close to the finale. And I couldn't find them anywhere. It was pitch black. And I heard these voices, like, out in a field somewhere. And sure enough, there they were running around chasing lightning bugs. <laughs> Just amazed by these creatures of the lightning bug. Right? And I thought in my head in that moment, that's a parable for life. In a life 
filled with fireworks and loud noises and, and booms left and right and in front of you. Notice the lightning bug. And summer, I mean, summer is a time when, when schedules change. I invite you and challenge yourself to, to schedule in some time to rest, to gaze upon, as the psalm said last week, the beauty of the Lord. Right, to, to, to rest in the beauty of God's created world. I mean, maybe that looks like a weekend or a vacation or a quick 10-minute stop at the beach to look at the ocean and, and to wonder what God might have for you in this life or stop by the sound and to enjoy a sunset and to hear again that sermon from the sky, that Psalm 19 points us towards, I mean, pay attention. I mean, the queen of, of paying attention in my book is the poet Mary Oliver. I had someone come out the door last week who, who I think I introduced them to Mary Oliver and was hoping that I was going to mention her in last week's service. And so I was like, girl, you ain't got to ask me twice. <laughs> like, I'm coming in hot with Mary Oliver this week. So I kind of just want to read you her poetry for the rest of the time, but I won't fully do that. But her poetry, one of the things I like about it is it inspires me to, to pay attention, to pay attention to nature, to pay attention to my surroundings, right? to, to pay attention and to hear that, that sermon from Psalm 19, to inform a life, to, to even change a life. I listened to an interview from her this past week, and she said, I quoted Dostoevsky last week, that quote, that beauty will save the world. We're going to pick that up in the coming weeks again. And she quoted it again in her interview. She said, beauty, the beauty of the world saved my life. She grew up in a household that was abusive, and so she spent every waking minute that she could outside, in the forest, taking walks. And she said, that beauty saved my life, and it got her in the practice of paying attention you spend enough hours out of there, out there, you start to notice things. And as she started to notice things, she started to, to write them down and to, to string them together into poems. But she's a, the queen of paying attention. I'm going to read one poem called Invitation for You. It says, Oh, do you have time to linger for just a little while out of your busy and very important day for the goldfinches that have gathered in a field of thistles for a musical battle, to see who can sing the highest note or the lowest, or the most expressive of mirth or the most tender. Their strong, blunt beaks drink the air as they strive melodiously, not for your sake and not for mine and not for the sake of winning, but for the sheer delight and gratitude. Believe us, they say, it is a serious thing just to be alive on this fresh morning in this broken world. I beg of you, do not walk by without pausing to attend to this rather ridiculous performance. It could mean something. It could mean everything. It could be what Rilke meant when he wrote, you must change your life. I love how she's always, whenever I read her, it just inspires me to, to, to pay attention. And so much of her poetry isn't just about paying attention, but once she pays attention, it causes her to consider something bigger, right? The one who created In one of her most famous poems, When Death Comes, I was just going to read for you lines, but I'm looking at this clock and we got time. So settle in. I'm going to read all of this one. When Death Comes. She writes, When death comes, like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snap the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is going to be like that cottage of darkness. And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and sisterhood. I look upon time as no more than idea, and I consider eternity, and I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy, and a singular and each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending, as all music does, towards silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life, 
I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. I love that in her poetry, right, as she considers the daisy and the flower, right, it leads her to, to thinking bigger. And I found it true in contemplating and experiencing the beauty of the earth. Right, it leads me to consider something bigger, someone bigger, the one who created it all, and where my life fits in all that. It helps me to, to hear right, that sermon, Psalm 19, that the psalmist references. Right, the beauty of the earth can be an invitation to worship, right, a signpost of the world to come, right, a foretaste of the beauty that we'll experience every single day in eternity. And I also know that life can be overwhelming, right, that life can be so beautiful, but life can also be so hard with grief and loneliness even despair. And maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you have found your way into worship, beat down, exhausted, maybe grieving, maybe not ready to hear all this beauty talk. Yet I also know that God's creation may not fix what you're going through, but I think it can be a balm. So often nature can be a balm in Gilead. And I mean, I, I don't think that, that it's a coincidence that... When the, perfect, when the scriptures describe the perfection of our world, it's described as a garden. Right? That when the, Jesus' disciples, after he was crucified, when they didn't know what to do, they head to the sea to go fishing. Right? That when Jesus was preparing to bear the cross, where did he want to be? He wanted to be with his best friends in a garden. Right? That there's something that, that nature and the created world can do to us. I know that myself, when I get stressed or, or uncertain or not sure what to do next, if I take a walk or, or get in the water, it doesn't solve it, everything, but something feels better. Something seems a touch clearer. Like when you look at the, the sparrow, you realize God's got the sparrow, God's got me. I mean, another favorite author, Wendell Berry, I'm going to keep these authors coming. <laughs> He writes about despair and, you know, that, that same feeling of, of overwhelm and, and despair. And I, I come back to this poem so often because there's, when you watch the news, they're like dealers in, in despair. As you watch it too long, you can get overwhelmed with, with things to, to despair about. And so he's, he writes, and maybe his most famous one, The Peace of the Wild Things, he writes this. When despair for the world grows in me, and when I wake in the night... At the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars watching with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. So if you've got nothing else this week, read some Mary Oliver and some Wendell Berry. So this morning, may you surround yourself with the beauty of creation. May you experience the, the balm of the created world. May you pay attention to God's glory hidden in creation. To quote Alice Walker, I think it peeves God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and you don't notice it. So may you notice it, and because you notice it, may the beauty of the created world lead you closer to the one who created it all. May every sunrise, sunset, sky full of stars give witness to the glory of God. And this morning I pray that the beauty of the earth leads you into wonder and worship of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, we give you thanks and praise for this day. Lord, we give you thanks for the beauty of the created world. Lord, we pray that we would be caretakers of that gift, 
of that beauty, of that message, of your message of care, your message of love, your message of grace. God, might we feel that this morning and everywhere we go from here. For it's your holy name we pray. Amen. We've got a little video benediction for you. So if Amber, if you'll play that just to give you a moment to, to contemplate the beauty of the created world. May Christ, who shimmers in all creation, surprise you each day with glittering moments. When you can see again how light lives in everything, how it partners with dark soil to bring forth aster and lavender, rosemary and daffodils, a hundred kinds of squash, Amen. Now, may you stand and sing with me our closing hymn, number 92, For the Beauty of the Earth. And go forth in peace and may the strength of God, love of Jesus Christ, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.